Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I'm Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s and today we're talking about planning for year-round color or planning for four seasons of color in your garden. And um, honestly, it, it's, a, it's another big topic to tackle. It's one that uh, there is a handout uh, that's accompanying the talk, but again, it's on a minimal scale just giving you some of kind of my top hit plant suggestions for kind of each quarter of the year um, and to own up to being uh, kind of at the last minute I did finish it late in the day yesterday so it doesn't have any fancy pictures yet it is posted and if you need to um, have help finding it just put a comment in the comment section and and we'll me make sure to link it directly to you uh, but check back later and we will have added photos to the um, article as well. What, uh, what we're really talking about, four seasons of color. Um, now, you know, let's, let's break that down just a little bit. Color at different times of year. I mean, there are certain times of year where color is flowers um, by all means. But if you, you know, look both on the far stage right of my table or far left of my table, you see kind of the extremes of the season in foliage color and bark color. And then there's the added berry um, aspect that we usually kind of have as just another colorful element to plants, usually in late summer, fall, and often through the winter. So um, colorful branches and foliage, bark and stems of uh, dormant or deciduous plants, and then, um, you know, the golds and, and um, oh, sorry, the, you know, red and sometimes purple berries that we associate with some of our um, berrying plants as well. <clears throat> now, in order to have a garden with multiple seasons of interest or four seasons of color, it does require a little bit of advanced planning and especially if you have a small space. So obviously small space gardens, you need to be, uh, you're, you're more limited with the number of plants that you can uh, use in your garden and you need to be more thoughtful about the plants themselves um, so that there is, again, something that is featured or is, um, you know, at its peak at various times throughout the season. Also, if you are in a deep shade uh, garden, if your garden is shade or mostly shade, your color is also going to come mostly from foliage rather than flowers. Um, so an occasional flower, absolutely, but the, the deeper and deeper the shade, the more uh, colors of uh, leaves, <clears throat> Textures, plant form, all of these things are going to give you that added color dimension because the background of a deep shade garden is typically a really dark green. So other than green is what we would have um, to kind of show up against the deep dark foliage of a shade garden. But in that kind of sweet spot of um, partial to full sun, so four to six hours or even more sun, uh, we can grow a wide range of plants that both have uh, winter interest, sp early spring interest in the, maybe the emerging foliage, for example. Uh, this is a rose that we don't normally think of roses as something that we would grow for their leaves, but the brand new leaves on this rose are uh, just as dark as like the beautiful uh, foliage on a barberry, for example, or on the hookera. So, as these leaves become a little bit more mature, they'll fade to a regular green. But right now we've got this beautiful red stems, red leaves that add some interest in the early spring to our garden. Later on, this rose will be a completely different feature to our summer garden as a, a, a flower, just a nonstop flower making machine that will bloom from June uh, a bit on kind of a six week cycle through till usually frost and sometimes even beyond. Uh, this is Firefighter, which is one of our favorite 
um, kind of classic red, fragrant red hybrid tea. Oop, does have thorns. Fragrant red hybrid tea rose. Uh, oop, that has a great disease resistance and a, a fairly tall profile in the garden. So as I mentioned, a hybrid tea. It's gonna go up against the back uh, section, probably you know the further back layer of the garden, ending up at five, six feet tall as it flowers. But it's been cut back uh, for this time of year, so it starts off kind of small every season. So <clears throat> thinking again about what is color in your garden uh, and expanding your definition of color beyond simply flowers, um, I don't really, you know, from with the exception of these gorgeous rhododendrons that are in bloom, this portion of my plant selection on the table is still quite colorful, but there's no flowers yet on any of them. So we're really pulling the interest of the foliage in their colors and their shapes, their um, just kind of different personalities amongst one another, which adds to the plant's beauty before and after it comes into bloom. So talking about that, before and after bloom, right? I mean, if there was a plant that, you know, hit everybody's kind of, you know, top three requirements, right? Evergreen, low maintenance, and blooms all year long. I mean, if that plant existed, First of all, that would be the only plant we ever saw, right? Everybody's garden would just be full of that plant. It's perfect. It's evergreen. It's low maintenance and it blooms constantly. But there is not, that plant doesn't exist. And, and if it did and everybody planted the same plant, soon we would all be wanting something different anyways. So not to mention there's vulnerabilities of, you know, everybody planting the same thing. However, There are, well, first of all, it's one of the reasons why people hire garden designers and landscape designers and uh, plan for their gardens is to plan out the different times of the year. The various plants are uh, at their peak, as I mentioned, and then layer those plants into their garden to make sure that they've got something happening at all times. Now, you may not be able to have like every view in your entire garden be just like fireworks all year long. But I often also think about the spaces in my garden and how I, how I live and how I enjoy them and then try to focus on that time of year for them to really be fantastic. And I, if that doesn't make sense, t take this uh, example. The view that I see out my kitchen you know, sliding glass door and kitchen window is a view that I want to look good in the winter because I'm standing there doing a lot of cooking. I'm in the kitchen. I'm always, you know, but I'm not all the way out into the garden necessarily in the winter time as often. So I want that area to look great at a time where I maybe don't interact as much with it. But then the space around my um, kind of seating area, where I have my patio and we eat and entertain in the summertime, that's the space that I want to be fantastic in summer when we're out enjoying it. So obviously the flowers that should bloom there uh, bloom about that time of year. The fragrance um, that, you know, can enhance our enjoyability of the space takes, uh, you know, it comes into consideration as well so that then as we're sitting outside and enjoying our garden, we have that summer bloom and summer feature uh, and then again, those, you know, fall and winter times where we may really only see our garden from inside the house can be focused on by the views that are framed outside when you're inside your house. Um, I have a, well, Becky, uh, everyone knows camera woman, Becky, you don't really, but you do. Uh, Becky just bought a new house. Congratulations, Becky. And one of the things that she just showed me was the view out her windows, which really frames you know, the way that we look at our garden for at least almost half the year here in the Portland area, um, we're inside looking out rather than, you know, outside looking out. So um, that view is really important and, um, you know, play with 
uh, right now where it's kind of cold outside, maybe you don't want to go out into your garden too much, work on, you know, identifying where those spaces are so that you can improve the immediate look outside your, your windows when you're spending your time indoors. Now, beyond professional design, lots of research and planning or just kind of starting by using my you know basic list that could go so much further into a long long list of plants but uh, to just get you started one of the things that I used as a criteria is uh, if it is a perennial on the list it needs to be extremely long blooming, which means that it's going to flower for six or eight weeks or more. Um, so perennials, as many of us know, some perennials can be really short flowering. I mean, a spectacular bloom like a delphinium, for example, but may only bloom for three or four weeks. Um, so getting that long season of bloom from a perennial is going to stretch out obviously the season of color that we have from the plants and make them really kind of worth their weight in or you know their space in a garden whether it's large or small shrubs as well um, i think the importance of shrubs is either also an extremely long bloom season or the form itself is good through you know spring or summer or winter or all of them so it may flower but it's also evergreen such as the rhododendrons um, or it may be deciduous and have beautiful uh, stems like the twig dogwoods but a few of the newer twig dogwood selections also have really brilliantly colored foliage um, a golden leaf on some of the red newer red twig dogwoods there's i think this is called creme de menthe uh, yep, creme de mint, uh, which is like a yellow twig dogwood, but a variegated leaf on the outside. So flashy, even when it's leafed out. Although we normally think of twig dogwoods as winter interest with those beautiful red stems we see in the, um, in the winter when the plant has no foliage. So The final way, really, and I think that, I mean, this is a, it's a longer process, but certainly an easy and an enjoyable process is to simply walk through, you know, take your favorite garden center, hopefully it's ours, and make a regular visit every six or eight weeks. Come in every six or eight weeks with a budget perhaps, I mean, you can only plant so many plants, but then make your purchase every time you come in be something that you just fall for at the moment. Um, I mean, that doesn't, that's not crazy because you're gonna love your garden all the time at the end of the year, but usually when you walk into a garden center, the things that are in bloom are featured. We have the most of them. You can see their colors and get uh, kind of, you know, a best sense of what they look and bloom and smell like and if you keep yourself to a budget and walk in buying something that's featured every six weeks or eight weeks and continue that through the season at the end of a year of doing that you will have something that is uh, featureable or featured uh, every six or eight weeks through the year in your garden as well so it's a simple, I mean, most garden centers are going to put right up front and center what's looking good today, um, what is featured out in the landscape or in gardens. And so it's going to be an easy thing to match your garden conditions, your taste, and um, just kind of plot away at planting little bits at a time, ending up with a long, uh, long plan of really great looking stuff. Now we also are talking about layering in the sense of using not just a bunch of shrubs, but uh, trees, there are fabulous trees with, I left a whole bunch of plants outside, fabulous trees with great um, color at different times of year. I mean, we've got dogwoods about to bloom. Uh, we have, this is our Pacific Fire Vine Maple, which has this kind of apricot colored stems the coral bark Japanese maple, very similar look to the uh, winter 
bark and stems. So when the plants are bare, they have colorful foliage themselves. <clears throat> Trees that bloom and are, you know, really showy blooms, such as our ornamental cherries or flowering cherries. As I mentioned, the dogwoods that are coming up next um, into the, you know, late winter, spring. We have magnolias that stretch a season of blooms depending on the type of magnolia, some bloom as early as late February, March. And then there are several magnolias that are in the peak of their bloom at the moment. And something like the evergreen type magnolias, which are more of a late spring flowering tree uh, yet, to, yet to come into bloom. Um, Japanese snowbells are one of our tr classic summer flowering trees, late spring, early summer. Um, again, very showy little dangles of white or pale pink, um, kind of ballerina skirt looking flowers. July, September, crepe myrtles are really kind of the star of that late summer garden in tree form. Um, crepe myrtles bloom late summer, fall, usually in hot pinks and reds and lavenders, but there's white as well. But a crepe myrtle also has terrific fall color and then drops its leaves and many varieties of crepe myrtle develop kind of a, like a puzzled patch of uh, interesting bark, kind of light in color and patterned so that you also notice the beauty of that tree in the dead of winter. So crepe myrtle, a good example of multiple seasons of interest. And same with a lot of the acers, uh, Japanese maples, vine maples, and even like upright red maples, uh, gorgeous fall color and then in many cases right this time of year we see them leafing out with their like beautiful tender spring growth and yes maples do flower it's just not uh one of those you know like flower flowers that we really see but if you if you notice things in their detail the delicate flower of a maple at this time of year is really special so uh conifers obviously here i've got our lemon cypress Conifers certainly do take on um, probably their most featured or important role in the winter months. So winter through early spring, we really notice the evergreens and the conifers. The, the bright light color, like the lemon of the lemon cypress, the golds. Sometimes we see golds even pop out more uh, extreme in winter on plants as they sort of develop a winter color. Um, but the blues, kind of steely blues or blue grays of things like the um, blue Italian cypress, some of the Japanese white pines, um, also uh, our blue, excuse me, col obvious blue, Colorado blue spruce, also gorgeous foliage color that gives us a contrast to green, even though it may not be, you know, flower colorful when you think of it as, as that um, how it reads in your garden, so to speak. So trees. Now, shrubs. Shrubs for uh, January through March. I've got um, the tail end of our winter Daphne, for example, which I know is up here way up at the corner. Winter Daphne has uh, another one of those multiple seasons of interest plants. Beautiful variegated foliage, especially the bright, bright green, just like soft, tender new leaves. Um, but we can see some of the older foliage as well. It gets that deeper green with a golden ring kind of at the very edge. Just finished blooming. It may still be flowering in your garden. Uh, kind of a pale pink, incredibly scented, very fragrant flower that really wafts and carries for a long distance in the garden. So uh, again, hitting multiple senses, but the color alone um, is really beautiful and adds not only foliage, but that flower interest in February. Uh, it is an evergreen, so we get that lovely color throughout the year on this plant and usually blooms about the time as daffodils are blooming and um, right before like forsythia, for example. So uh, Daphne, obvious for the uh, early, early spring. Camellias, we've got the kind of tail end of our winter flowering camellias are just wrapping up. And then we are seeing the beginning of the spring blooming camellias. The japonicas are just starting in that Janu uh, uh, January through March time frame. So right now, here we are in April, um, we've got the 
japonica camellia is kind of at their peak of bloom um, and the sasanquas have pretty much tailed off for the season. Evergreen as well on the camellia, so adding uh, multiple seasons of interest in that sense as well. Toy dogwoods, that same January through February, or January through March, as I mentioned. Uh, Mahonia, Oregon grape, that bright, bright yellow flower on Oregon grape right now is honestly, the foliage is dark, these flowers are bright, bright yellow, and a lot of people like to kind of, I don't know, poo-poo Oregon grape, but it's extremely important for hummingbirds and area pollinators. And if you're trying to support those animals and um, creatures in your garden, then uh, it's just as important to offer something like the flowering organ grape for them um, and, you know, put up with it, I suppose, in your garden. It's evergreen, it's drought tolerant, very low maintenance, easy care plant. Um, and I love it. There's lots of different varieties. So um, just because you see one that's big and kind of scraff, scraggly looking doesn't mean that you can't fall in love with the lower growing form um, called Mahonia repens. Uh, Osmanthus is another one. I, I, I had it. I left a whole stack of plants out on the outside of the garage door. Probably a good thing because there's no more room on my table and I would be like holding things up. But um, come and see me and I'll show you all of these plants happily. Quince just finished blooming. Forsythia, the yellow kind of harbinger of spring, has just again kind of wrapped up its flowering since we're talking about that January through March group. Arbutus, another one I left outside, is the compact strawberry bush, evergreen, uh, ericacea flowers, so little bell-shaped flowers uh, that literally bloom multiple times throughout the year and produce a little strawberry-like fruit, um, which is where it gets its name, strawberry bush. And then the fruit and flowers are often on the plant at the same time. Beautiful burgundy stems, kind of that same color as we have this new uh, growth on the rose. And um, a fairly good sized plant for full sun and drought tolerance too. So Arbutus looks great all the time. Pieris, sometimes we call it Andromeda, string of pearls. Such a classic plant that goes with rhododendrons, azaleas, kind of grows in those same conditions. Um, Pieris, there are multiple varieties of the Pieris and the some of the more popular forest flame, mountain fire, um, and another one that's called silver flame have also the new growth comes out like brick red, uh, orange color, as well as their kind of pendulous fragrant white flowers that are blooming right now. Hummingbirds and bees also love the blooms off of Pieris. Uh, Ribes, red flowering currant, another one. Hummingbirds and local pollinators love. Red flowering currant is one of our natives. It's also just wrapping up its flowering in uh, the garden centers, but in my garden, I still have really them kind of in full bloom. Uh, red flowering currant is available as a native plant, and then there are cultivars of it, such as King Edward VII. Um, a fairly good sized plant with pendulous kind of pinkish red flowers that hang down in little clusters before the leaves really come out. So usually it's really showy because you see all these flowers on kind of a bare branch uh, and then the leaves come out. So another beauty that later in the season, often the red flowering currants will make a fruit uh, that just adds interest in the garden. It's kind of a little blackish purple currant type fruit that birds like, but when it hangs in clusters, it's also very pretty. Um, perennial wise, also just kind of finished up for the season, hellebores, our heather, uh, the spring or winter blooming heather and heath with their gorgeous evergreen foliage. Often the heath will turn colors in the winter, giving us this again, darker burgundy colors like the firefly, winter chocolate, uh, get these beautiful dark chocolatey colors on the leaves and then green back up for spring. And uh, Spring Torch, one of my favorite Kalunas, is just kind of a dark green, kind of olivey green. And then as it pushes out new growth in the spring, it looks like tiny little lit matches basically that just pop out of the plant. They are kind of a coral 
yellow tipped with coral base uh, new growth that eventually grows to green. And spring torch also blooms uh, in the summertime, kind of a mauve pink flower. So again, one of those that has a two time of the year feature, early spring with its little spring torch, and then later in the summer with a standard um, flower like a heath does. Bleeding hearts, uh, most of us are familiar with bleeding hearts, classic shade garden perennial euphorbia. I think a lot of us are more and more frequently noticing euphorbia. This is Ascot rainbow, which is just a really showy plant at the moment. But even when not in bloom, you can see the variegated edged leaves of Ascot rainbow and also these really pretty kind of burgundy red stems. So an evergreen perennial, it's there all winter long. Then in March, starts to pop up with its uh, flower stalks and these blooms, which aren't exactly uh, delicate flowers. They're pretty sturdy flowers. They last for a month or six weeks or even longer in the garden. And then as you cut those back, you have that nice foliage that remains through the rest of the season. Euphorbia are <clears throat> available in a range of foliage colors and heights but usually that flower is that kind of like um, chartreuse or acid green color. Violas, everybody loves violas. Our perennial violas are kind of, again, one of our classic shade garden plants. Here are, uh, is one of our really sweet perennial primroses. So this is Bellarina nectarine. It's a primrose that's hardy to like negative 30 degrees. It's fragrant. It's been blooming for a couple of months now and doesn't fully look like it's ready to be done. So we have new flowers down at the bottom. These primroses come in a range of colors, but I'm a sucker for this, I call this like sunset blend. Um, and so they always stay low, deer and rabbit resistant, grow in partial shade to shade. This is an early spring flower that, um, doesn't even tend to be bothered much by slugs, which kind of amazes me. So, um, Viola's Primula, Cl Clematis armandii, the evergreen Clematis, which is in bloom right now, spectacular, kind of creamy white flowers, incredibly fragrant. Um, more primrose that I have up here. I've got the cutest little oak leaf primrose. So it's got this cool, different shaped leaf. Okay, take you back to the bellerina. So you can see the bellerina leaf, just kind of a patterned but oval. And then we've got this neat shape of the oak leaf primrose. And this is one of the more candelabra style flowers, which is just like it sounds. Um, the blooms are on little extensions, giving us that nice long stem and extended bloom with many, many flowers still coming up in the center. No, nah, lightly fragrant. There's just not enough flower to really hold a scent in that one. But then here, go back to our little bellerina and even really pretty together. Um, sturdy, easy care, low maintenance, early spring blooming perennials. This one's called Yellow Piketty, the oak leaf primrose. <clears throat> and then while I'm up in the front of my table, Wallflowers, uh, this is Erysimum and Cherianthus. We've got uh, Winter Sorbet and Fragrant Star. And yeah, they are fragrant. These are also evergreen perennials. Very early blooming, kind of low and almost shrubby. So you can see all of the flower buds that are about to come out on this one here. And yes, lightly fragrant. Um, you have to put your nose in it, but you know, so sorry for you. Uh, now this one here, the Fragrant Star, we can see it's kind of low and compact, but still lots and lots of flower buds starting. It's a cool combination of purple buds that open to this kind of uh, golden flower. And then because it's been um, snowing in 30 degrees here, it's got winter color on the leaves. So we've got some kind of streaks of purple on the foliage where it normally is more of a, let's see if I can get into a more protected area. Normally the foliage is more of a just green and white or green and cream stripe. 
So winter color, winter uh, cold on plants will often uh, cause them to develop kind of a stress color, uh, which is just their way. It's like sunscreen or cold screen. You know, it's just their way of dealing with uh, the weather. We can see that again here in Agastache Morello. You can see that beautiful kind of purple tone of the leaves. <clears throat> but if we look in a more protected space, so this is like, here's a contrast of a leaf further up on the plant, getting more cold exposure, and a leaf further down on the plant and the color that it really is normally gonna be. So spring and summer will have it be that nice green. Um, but I'm ahead of myself talking about Agastache, so we'll put it down. Also dressing up my table over here on the winter side or first quarter side. Tulips, because bulbs are a whole nother layer that we can think about in adding color to our garden year round or seasonal color. Spring flowering bulbs get planted in the fall. So in October is like the best month to put things like daffodils, narcissus, tulips in the ground, crocus, hyacinths, etc. Then our summer blooming flowers that come from bulbs such as dahlias, lilies, uh, begonias, gladiolas, those are planted in the spring months. So um, you have to think ahead usually to prepare and plant for something like a tulip to come up in the spring. It had to have been planted the season before, but that's an easy thing as you are planning your garden to be putting in that kind of additional season of bloom. Um, tuck it in right in front of a summer flowering plant, for example, and that gives you for sure, you know, color early and then you've got something that will give you that color later. Excuse me. Uh, shrubs in the a, April, June, so kind of late spring and into early summer time of year are, um, this is an easy one, right? Mexican orange is just coming into bloom, smells great. Azaleas and rhododendrons, the flower time for azaleas and rhododendrons, we've got very early bloomers um, and then rhododendrons and azaleas that flower uh, and Mother's Day and, and well beyond Mother's Day. Here I have, I, I, I would say two of my favorites, but you know, who, who am I fooling? There's a lot of favorites when it comes to plants and rhododendrons alone, but this is unique. That's the name, unique rhododendron. It has um, a really sweet leaf. So this kind of smaller rounded leaf that is not that kind of big pointy classic rhodi leaf. So a nice pretty foliage. Uh, the bud of the flower of course is this deep pink and when it fully opens it's almost a creamy yellow. So a gorgeous rhododendron for kind of mid-size and uh, compact grows best in partial sun or shade. And then a completely different looking rhodi back here is called sapphire. Well, sapphire um, is is one of the roadies that's trying to be blue. They're never really blue. They're kind of a deep purple more than anything else or a purple shade of blue or what is that, violet? I, I always call it blurple, but I know that's not a color. This has also, so it's in bloom right now, fairly early bloomer, but another very different looking leaf from our classic rhododendron leaf. It's very small, evergreen again, but smaller than even a typical azalea leaf is. So usually, and you know, I've dealt with this many times, we think rhododendrons have big leaves and maybe big flowers and azaleas have little leaves and little flowers, but that's not always the case. So this is rhododendron sapphire, small cluster of flowers, small foliage, a low growing kind of tight mounding, low growing plant and tolerance of just a little bit more sun um, as well than the unique grody, but gorgeous together. Uh, and then a, that evergreen aspect that gives us more interest throughout the season. Azaleas, I am bringing the azaleas in, but you know what they are, right? Um, Camellia japonica, Nandina, left it out in the garage. Um, the Nandina heavenly bamboo right now 
April through June, lots of plants are putting out their new growth. And that new growth, as I mentioned, is often this just classic burgundy, almost purple burgundy maroon color. And then the new growth as it matures fades to green and gets a little bit like sturdier and harder, maybe a little bit of wax coating to it or a thicker cell uh, as it changes from this burgundy to green. Heavenly Bamboo or Nandina, new growth coming out this time of year, ranges from kind of coppers and peaches and apricots to that, again, burgundy, almost purple or uh, brick red or somewhere in between. On the base of the plant, you have more green foliage and it's the exterior, the top and the outer edges that's pushing out the new growth that gives you the brightest color. So you kind of get this two-tone look that almost looks like flowers on the plant. So um, that's where Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo is doing stuff in the April, June months. We get into uh, Viburnums. There's so many different varieties of Viburnums, but that's kind of their peak time of bloom, um, April through June, although like Viburnum tinus and Viburnum Davidi, uh, two of our evergreen Viburnums are actually in bloom more this time of year. So kind of finishing up um, by early to mid April, evergreen plants as well. So they make berries too later in the summer, giving us multiple seasons of interest and color. <clears throat> Towards June, I mean, let's get real. Nobody cares about anything other than hydrangeas and roses when it comes to color and flower power in the garden. I consider uh, the two plants probably in the, in the shrub category, two of the longest blooming plants that we have um, to put in our landscape. Roses, you are at least restricted on roses to at least six hours of sun or more. So you need an area that is exposed to, uh, that's open and exposed to sunlight to really successfully grow roses with bloom uh, and, and few disease issues. But if you can't grow a rose because of light uh, issues, not enough sunlight, then hydrangeas are your next best choice. Um, the, the ability of hydrangeas to take sun really kind of depends on what type of hydrangea it is. So we have our classic hydrangeas. This is Bloomstruck which is the classic shade style hydrangea that we sometimes call mop head, um, big leaf hydrangea. Best in a little bit of sun, filtered sun, and then at least hot afternoon shade. We're talking about a plant that grows to about three, four feet tall and wide and is already budded, although it's a little early to be blooming um, in the snow. I, nobody, no, plants don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do in this kind of weather. I'm trying to just not talk about it, but if you're here, you know what we're dealing with. Um, and if you're somewhere that's really like really in winter, just put up with our belly aching because it's, it's still just it's hard for gardeners to deal with snow in April when it's not normal. I'm sure it's hard for you when it is normal, but you know, we're all in this. So it's blooming right or budded right now, probably shouldn't be. I would like to see it budded closer to mm, late May, early June, but then hydrangeas will flower often until frost or later. So that's September, October, um, giving us blooms through the entire season. Endless summer varieties uh, and the re-blooming hydrangeas, some of these newer and next generation hydrangeas give us the longest flowering time because they form flowers on both old wood and later in the season on new wood. So right now we've got the flowers that have formed on previous year's growth and that's what's budding up now. But then we have new growth that's coming up towards the inside and outer, you know, lower portions of the plant, new growth that'll come up to form flower buds later in the summer to extend that bloom time. So endless summer types or rebloomers do have a longer season of flowering than even a traditional, um, more old fashioned style hydrangea. But uh, for more sun tolerance in hydrangeas, we go to the panicle bloomers or what is sometimes just called uh, paniculata hydrangeas. PG hydrangeas is one of the kind of older references of them. 
They are another one of the plants that breeders are having a lot of fun with. There's um, <clears throat> limelight, which is sort of an apple green, very dramatic, large flower plume that's kind of cone-shaped instead of rounded and domed. Long cone shape and limelight fades to, goes from the apple green to kind of an ivory to a beautiful pink color as the flower fades. And another s s mid to late summer bloomer on into frost or beyond. And then quick fire, or this is little quick fire, shows here's sort of a, a, a good view of the, I don't know, work with me, a good view of the young flowers, white, pale white, kind of airy panicles. And then as those flowers age and fade, they turn a brilliant, deep pink, almost reddish color. So that also happens in summer to late summer and on into fall. <clears throat> Perennial wise on uh, the April, June spectrum, Brunera, here's our Brunera Jack Frost. Not only does it have those cute uh, kind of false forget-me-not or forget-me-not looking blooms, but it has a really attractive leaf that's just starting to come on uh, that is great in shade or partial shade. So it's a real kind of white silver veining over the green of this leaf that shows up in the dark parts of our gardens where it is kind of shady and everything's deep or dark green. Um, grows as kind of a lower ground cover uh, until it gives us these nice airy, beautiful blue flowers in early spring and um, is, is very hardy in the garden. So Bronera is great for really multiple seasons. Campanula is just coming into bloom for the April, June season. Hosta uh, are going to uh, really give, a, again, in shade, a wide range of colors. Hosta can be variegated or like a steely blue, kind of a powdery blue, um, variegated green and white, variegated yellow and green. And then later in the summer, hosta also make flowers um, that are lily shaped on long stems since they're in the lily family. So um, a still be another one that some of these summer ones aren't yet in bloom. So I didn't bring any a still be in. Hardy geranium, long blooming, kind of low mounding perennial that's great for filling in spaces around shrubs in your garden. Sun, partial sun on hardy geraniums. Lavender. Now I've got two kinds of lavender just on my table for fun. One is in bloom right now, and that's the Spanish lavender. And Spanish lavender is always one of the earliest to bloom. And it's very recognizable with its little uh, kind of spiky top, uh, kind of rabbit ear looking flowers on top. Spanish lavender will give you flowers early season and then usually a lighter bloom again in late fall. Whereas something like our French lavender, here's Provence, is just starting to send up its tiny, tight flower stalks to be in bloom in another six weeks or so uh, and extending its flowers for another then six or eight weeks beyond that. So lavender, even depending on the type of lavender you choose, you can have a longer bloom time from Spanish to French um, will give you months of lavender flowers. And lavender is evergreen as well. So a really hard working plant that uh, gives us lots of blooms, fragrant, foliage, fragrant flowers, and evergreen uh, through the winter. Nepeta salvia hardy fuchsia. Nepeta. Nepeta is one of my favorites for a workhorse of a perennial. Doesn't look like much right now, um, but it's in the catnip, catmint family. Doesn't seem to be attractive to cats, so it's um, whatever catmint and catnip are different from each other. This seems to be the mint, but not the nip, so you don't have to worry about all of that. It is, um, its bloom is sort of this color, I would say close to the sapphire rhododendron. And so when it, what? just trying to give you an image here. So when it blooms, it's on a longer spike and it just becomes this like 
airy haze of this beautiful kind of soft blue pale lavender color flowers for months and months and is covered in bees um, and hummingbirds like it too so it's just always very active and popular in my garden um, and because it's just this sort of blur of activity and color uh, I tend to appreciate it from a distance um, towards kind of the mid portion of my border it gets like two by two as well so it's knee high and <clears throat> wide uh, and just kind of a uh, one of those easy easy care perennials that is very reliable best in sun or part sun hardy fuchsia and salvia so here is salvia hot lips i had to bring hot lips in because um it is a long bloomer it is a hummingbird magnet this is a large blooming perennial that flowers for months and months. In fact, it is budded up now, but often is blooming into September and October. So probably again, one of the longest flowering periods on uh, for a perennial. In cool season, it has a red and white or kind of pink and white bicolor flower. But by summertime, it tends to just go straight to kind of the reddish pink color um, solid. A flower machine that can be cut back in the spring it tends to be kind of semi evergreen drought tolerant like three by three so again kind of mid level or towards the back of your garden blooms literally all summer long <clears throat> oh and I hardy fuchsia another one this guy can bloom from like May through October so if we're looking for so whereas look, salvia hot lips is really best in Sun or partial Sun sort of the flower power equivalent of salvia would be a hardy fuchsia. Uh, hardy fuchsias are equally popular with hummingbirds. This is um, a, another long blooming May to October um, three by three or sometimes three by four. It depends on the type of fuchsia and it's similar to our hanging basket looking fuchsias that we have, you know, that we get for our moms for Mother's Day or put in our shady porches. Uh, but not quite as like fluffy and elaborate, um, although they can be. And they come in a range of colors as well. The foliage on hardy fuchsias are really, it's just very rem reminiscent as well of those fuchsia hanging baskets. And it is one of the plants that tends to uh, be a little bit sensitive to winter cold. And so um, it's good to mulch it in the fall as it kind of goes dormant and then wait to cut it back until you see little bits of growth on it in the early spring rather than cutting it way back in fall to you know tidy it up for the winter time um, and it's also one that sort of sleeps in a little bit late so breaks dormancy after some of these other plants have already kind of woken up for the season so not to be surprised crepe myrtle onto the july september months crepe myrtle is another one as i mentioned um, earlier that um, wakes up late in the season. So if you're watching um, and it just snowed for you and we're having unseasonable cold and you go out and you're looking around at sticks that haven't made leaves yet and crepe myrtle is one of them, just give it a little time. Um, we get calls every year about people that are sure that their crepe myrtle died, um, but it's just sleeping in and probably all for the better. So. Um, just it's always good to get to know your plants late that july september uh for shrubs rosa sharon which is that hardy hibiscus i don't really have one that looks like anything yet so um look it up or we'll put a picture in the uh in the the blog article for you hydrangeas again go on and on and on roses too abelia another one of my kind of favorite evergreen or semi-evergreen workhorse shrubs this is um i mean the foliage looks great all the time we have kind of pretty burgundy stems this chartreuse pale colored foliage that has sort of a variegation that's going to pop out more in the winter time and it also tends to turn sort of oranges and burgundy colors in the winter months as a response to cold i didn't pick a very good one showing us winter color because it's pushing out so much spring growth right now but abelia, this is kaleidoscope abelia. Abelia looks great uh, spring, summer, 
And in the late summer, fall, it actually makes a flower. So in addition to having colorful foliage, the flower is a pale pink, almost white, bell-shaped flower that's like half an inch or so, so it's decent in size. And it's nice and fragrant or lightly fragrant, um, kind of at the ends of the uh, ends of the new growth on the plant. So kind of out at the exterior. They are, um, as I mentioned, semi evergreen. So depending on the winter, sometimes they drop some leaves and then leaf back out. Uh, Berberus or barberry, another one that the color that we get from barberry, even though most of them drop their leaves in the winter, it's that same just amazing burgundy or reddish colored foliage that contrasts just brilliantly with greens, looks great with golds, it's gorgeous with, you know, almost any color in the garden. And so barberry blend beautifully with other landscape plants, adding just that, not necessarily flower color, but foliage color contrast. However, barberry, as I mentioned, most of them do drop their leaves in the winter time. So Barbary looks great in the summer and uh, as the foliage kind of intensifies its colors in the fall before it drops. Perennials for the July, September months, ornamental grasses, um, quite a few of those late season winter dormant or ornamental grasses I haven't really brought in yet. Uh, they still look kind of cut back and um, dormant, but we've got some great evergreen ornamental grasses that are lots of fun this time of year. This is Deschampsia Northern Lights. Um, it's, it's, does it have a common name? I don't know if it has a common name or not, but Deschampsia Northern Lights. It's pettable. It's got uh, this green and gold variegation, but right now it's taken on sort of a pinkish purple hue as well. So again, that winter color that you see this is um, deer resistant, believe it or not. It is best in sun or part shade. And with its little airy summer flower stalks that it does, it can be up to like three feet tall, but the foliage itself stays around a foot tall. Um, just a nice little clumping grass for a pretty contrast sun part shade. And then this is a Carex, and there's so many evergreen sedges or Carexes uh, that are, uh, there's green ones, there's green and gold, green and white variegated, finer textured, bigger, bigger, whiter leaves, a really big range of Carex. This one is Everillo, does best in partial sun or filtered sun. And we're actually seeing its flowers right now. So if you didn't have all these little like dangly things up at the top, it would just be a nice kind of graceful mound of chartreuse yellow foliage, evergreen or ever yellow um, there all winter and this is its little spiky bloom um, that's just happening this time of year adding texture and a little bit of color and interest uh, to the plant so yes ornamental grasses really are featured july september kind of late summer and then they go great great with uh, some of the other more like late season perennials hosta keep going japanese anemone um, one that bloom, you know, August, September, pink or white, kind of airy, long, wiry flower stalks and delicate little flowers that are attractive to, again, hummingbirds, butterflies, um, sun to part sun or part shade on a Japanese anemone. Salvia, not only the hot lips, but salvia from our perennial department. Bloom at various times of year. This is one called West uh, Wisui, which is budded and about to bloom. Viola Close, another one that's just beginning to bloom. We have May night, April, April night, May night. So obviously one that blooms more April, one that blooms more May. And salvia will repeat bloom if you cut them back, just like a lot of perennials that bloom in spring. Cut them back after they finish flowering and it will bloom again late summer or fall. So we have it as a um, later addition to our garden to boot. Uh, Echinacea coneflower, Rudbeckia, Agastache. These are, here I know I've got our Echinacea or coneflower. This is the um, 
kind of one of the more orangey, coppery, yellow kind of versions of it, but lots of color varieties in the Echinacea these days. Black Eyed Susan or uh, Rudbeckia, such a classic flower for full sun, drought tolerant, long blooming, like two by two on this perennial for late summer into fall. Agastache, as we were looking at before, this is Morello. Not only um, cool foliage, but this has this like long, fuzzy kind of plume of flower that is like a peachy apricot, coral, peachy apricot. I don't really, pe coral, maybe we'll call it coral. Um, bees, hummingbirds, for sure, love it. And false hyssop, uh, false hyssop is one of its common names. It has like a licorice the foliage has a cool smell to it. So another one of those I liked adding my senses, um, smell, sound. In this case, as you brush up against it or step on it, you know, you would have that nice smell. Asters, I didn't bring them in. Clematis, gosh, there's so many varieties of clematis and uh, we've just written about some in our newsletter. This is Nellie Mosier which Nellie Mosier is a spring bloomer, um, usually blooms like May, June, with this is gorgeous, large flower, but often then if you cut it back some, it can flat, like just nip it back a little bit after it finishes blooming in May, June, and it'll bloom again for you in September. Lots of our clematis spring bloomers will flower again in the late summer or fall. Um, Dahlias, another one of the bulbs that we would be purchasing about this time of year and then planting um, when the ground warms up just a little bit more. So I like to put my dahlias in by maybe mid-May. Um, if you do have dahlias in the ground right now, it may be time soon to pull the mulch away from uh, the area and let them come up, um, let the sun warm up the soil and let them come up from the ground. Dahlias are one of those plants that, depending on how well draining your soil is, are m considered perennials, but not always like a sure thing in the ground. Some people dig them up every year, but that's not a sure thing either. So um, you just have to figure out how to roll the dice with dahlias, but they are worth every minute of either, you know, panic and worry or digging and work or whatever. Um, dahlias give you lots of cut flowers <clears throat> for a long season uh, from mid to late summer on into the fall. And then in that October, November, October through December month, month, October through December quarter, uh, again, back to those acers, the coral bark maples, our conifers, crepe myrtles, that fall color that we get and the beautiful bark from crepe myrtles. Hydrangeas, believe it or not, often in our mild season, winter doesn't come until February or April. Uh, and so winter, the winter months on into December on hydrangeas and roses can often see a few, few flowers continuing to bloom on those later, later blooming uh, shrubs. Then we get into the fall and winter blooming camellias. As I kind of mentioned at the beginning, the Sasanqua camellias, classic is Yuletide camellia. It is bright red, blooms in Christmas, uh, through the Christmas season, through the Yuletide, and um, gets to be about eight feet tall and wide. The other Sasanqua camellias, uh, Cleopatra, gorgeous pink, apple blossom, kind of a bicolor, Setsugeka, pure white, these are gorgeous fall into winter bloomers on evergreen shrubs that are best in filtered sun, kind of partial sun, part shade, and um, extremely long blooming and attractive to hummingbirds. Um, so lots to offer in the Sasanqua camellias. Then as a uh, foliage, fall foliage plant, back to our twig dogwoods, the, the leaves, as they begin to drop on the twig dogwoods, usually turn colors of reds and pinks, fuchsias, and then drop off, leading us to the berries. 
uh, such as beautyberry, ketone aster, which really, pyracantha, they all start to turn their bright colors and be featured towards fall. Um, Nandina, as I mentioned, and then for perennials, asters, back to hardy fuchsias, uh, hellebores start blooming again, and hookara and some of the evergreen foliage plants that we have just look good all the time. So here's hookara, black taffeta, evergreen, uh, or again, nevergreen, but this always, this color always present in the garden, um, sturdy, great for containers or in, in the ground planting. Sun, part sun on black taffeta. This is marmalade, lime marmalade. And lime marmalade is part sun to shade, so it can sunburn in hot sun, but also evergreen, sturdy, uh, hardy, you know, great looking perennial for your garden or in containers, hookara. And the last one, foliage wise to mention, <clears throat> this is a yucca. So whereas uh, ornamental grasses tend to be a little bit finer and feather, feathery, yucca will become a little bit of a sharp kind of uh, structural plant in your garden, somewhere between shrub and grass in the long run. It can become uh, three to four feet tall and wide. This is a variety called Color Guard, but Color Guard yucca is, um, so full sun is best, deer and rabbit resistant, you get this color all the time. So um, the, the kind of salmons and corals are more of a winter effect. In spring and summer, we just get this really brilliant gold and green variegation. And then this is evergreen as well. So it's there all winter long, extremely drought tolerant, if I didn't already mention that, um, but it's also fire resistant. Um, so if you're trying to do, you know, fire scaping around your, um, home landscape this should be on your list as well yucca color guard uh, as i mentioned three to four feet tall and wide but hardy to like negative 20 degrees so um a super super tough plant let's not really worry about its flower because it's got all this going on so this is this is what's the interest in yucca um but looks great regardless other than the plants that I forgot to bring in, uh, I have covered and talked about pretty much everything on my table, which is an achievement. And I um, think that if you went to the lengths of adding something from the list that you'll see attached uh, to your garden throughout the various quarters that we've broken down through the seasons, you will end up in, uh, you will be thrilled with the effects of your four season garden. As uh, always, I appreciate you watching. Hope you learned something today. Happy gardening.